I have been growing vegetables for over two decades, starting with a very small space in an urban back garden. And every year since then, I've learned a lot about growing vegetables and about the many issues related to small-scale food production. Sometimes I'm really delighted by how well some of the vegetable plants grow, even though my standards and expectations have gradually been increasing. But I also wonder why I still haven't figured out how to deal with some of the key issues after all of these years. One of the excuses that I make is that I've chosen to try many different things, experimenting with uh, different types of gardening and method. And of course, I only have so much time and capacity. But this Red Gardens project is also very fertile ground for learning, and every year I learn more and more, and 2021 was no different. Most of the gardens that we grow in are organized in either rows or fixed beds, which makes planning and providing appropriate space for the diversity of crops a lot easier. But I have struggled with finding a suitable organizing system for the more integrated planting focus of the polyculture garden. Last year, I decided to divide each of the wide beds of this garden into a grid of clusters, each of which was designated to grow a single plant or a cluster of smaller plants, which would grow beside clusters of other unrelated crops. This clustered method of mixing crops works better for me, providing a flexible system for organizing and keeping track of all the plantings. And it is producing better results, which opens up a lot of opportunities for exploring the benefits and issues of this more integrated planting strategy. Sometimes the seeds we sow in the gardens don't grow very well, and I have wondered how much of this is due to the poor seed quality. So I decided to do a germination test on most of the seeds that I have in my collection. It was interesting to see how strongly and quickly some seeds germinated, how others were quite slow and only partially germinated, and how some seeds didn't germinate at all. Some of the seeds I know were really old, including seeds I saved over a decade ago, and I think some of them suffered from not being kept in ideal conditions, whereas some of the older seeds were surprisingly strong. But some seeds I purchased less than a year ago did not germinate at all, and I wonder how old these seeds really were. I've grown climbing beans for many years, but I never tried growing the bush bean versions of this popular vegetable. Last year, I had the great idea of using one of the beds in the large polytunnel to conduct a trial of lots of different varieties of bush beans. But lacking experience with this type of plant, I didn't realize that they also tend to need support, and most of the plants ended up falling over. Although we were still able to harvest a lot of beans, the task of harvesting was a lot more time consuming than it could have been. And a lot of the pods degraded when they were in contact with the soil, which made the yield comparisons between the varieties less reliable, making it harder to select varieties to grow again. We have been managing the beds of a larger polytunnel with a no-dig method, adding a substantial layer of compost onto the bed each season and leaving it on the surface rather than digging it in. But the compost that we added this year ended up drying out in places, due in part to the quality and type of compost that I bought in, but mainly because of the uneven watering patterns from the sprinklers and my lack of attention. Once it dried out, the compost actually repelled the water in some patches, causing it to flow over the surface of the bed to, to drain through a crack or less dry section. These dry patches caused very inconsistent germination of the direct sown seeds, leading to delays and reduced harvests from the spring crops, and some of the compost remained dry and unavailable for the soil biology and plants for a lot of the season. For most of the years in the gardens, I have generally made do with equipment and materials I could salvage or reuse. I was happy to avoid buying things that were not necessary and liked to be able to make do with what I could find locally, but this often cost me more time and effort in the gardens. Last year, I bought a big roll of biodegradable twine that a lot of professional growers use, as well as a load of clips and hooks specifically designed for hanging crops. Although there are costs, limitations, and issues with these materials, all of them saved a fair amount of time and made some regular tasks a lot easier, and we no longer had to pull out plastic twine before composting the vining crops. I used to leave most of the stems that grew on the eggplant or aubergine plants, allowing these plants to grow into their natural form as a multi-stemmed bush. But I have not been impressed with the amount of fruit that was produced in the past, and the plants were hard to control and suffered from a lot of mold. 
Last year, we tried a very different strategy of planting them closer together, pruning off all of the side shoots that formed, and training them up a piece of twine hung from the polytunnel structure. The plants were easier to manage, growing surprisingly tall, seemed a lot healthier, and produced more in the same area than the bush method, especially with a hybrid variety that we grew. As part of the setup for a large permaculture course last summer, I had the opportunity to build a temporary outdoor shower with the water heated as it flowed through a pipe buried in a compost pile. I was pleasantly surprised by how well it worked and interested in how a system like this can be adjusted by changing the types and proportions of materials used, the volume of compost and the length of the pipe in order to accommodate different uses. But I also realized through this exploration that when a compost pile is very hot, removing some of the heat can actually help to speed up the rate of decomposition by reducing the temperature to a level more hospitable for the thermophilic bacteria. As part of the exploration to boost the yields of the intensive garden, I constructed plastic covered cold frames to provide a warmer microclimate for several crops, including the bed of squash. And the plants definitely grew faster, at least at the start of the summer, quickly filling the space of the frame. But then the plants seemed to overcrowd it and did not produce as big of a yield of squash as in the past when they were grown without the cold frame. I think this might be because they were growing the same number of plants, but the added shelter allowed them to grow too big too quickly and ended up crowding each other out. So this year I will grow fewer plants in the same protected space to see if that works better. The garlic we grow in the polytunnel is consistently bigger than the same crops grown outside. Last year in the outside garden we planted the smaller cloves produced outside as well as the slightly larger cloves produced in the polytunnel. The plants grown from the polytunnel cloves seemed to grow bigger, which was expected, but they were also more delayed in maturing or seemed to grow for longer of the season before starting to develop the underground bulb. It seems that growing the garlic in warmer conditions one year for planting outside the following year could be a strategy for getting a significantly larger crop, even if I'm not sure why this would cause a plant to continue to grow for longer. Every year I try to encourage the ladybird population to develop in the polytunnels, occasionally bringing in bugs I find outside, in order to help to deal with the abundance of aphids that tend to appear in the late spring. This season the ladybird population seem to be missing, despite the abundance of aphids on some of the plants. But shortly after I put up a netting to prevent the blackbirds from getting into the polytunnel and digging out the compost of the beds, there was an abundance of ladybird larvae eating the aphids, and eventually a fantastic mix of this helpful insect at all stages of its life cycle. And a while later, after taking the netting down, the number of these useful insects dropped considerably, and I strongly suspect that one of the local bird species, perhaps the tiny wren, has developed a taste for the ladybirds, which is apparently not uncommon. Last year I finally replaced pallets with more appropriate panels that I built for containing the compost piles, which worked much better, but I still had to find a way to deal with the backlog of a load of old rotten and wet pallet wood. Because the wood of the pallets was not treated, I thought I would try to dry them for burning, and I built bins to store the cut-up pieces of pallets while they dried. I used fresh pallets for the base and walls to let the wind blow through, and with a plastic covering the top and the self-facing front to speed up the process. And I was surprised how quickly even the soaking wet pieces of wood dried in the moderate amounts of sun and abundance of wind that we get here in Ireland, and I think this drying ability can be quite useful in other tasks in the gardens. We put up a new polytunnel last year, but preparing the soil was delayed by the discovery of the buried remains of the edges of plastic from a large polytunnel that had blown down on the site a number of years ago. We were obviously frustrated that the negligence of the previous occupiers of this area was delaying planting and requiring a lot of unanticipated work to remove the deeply buried plastic. But it got me thinking about my own interventions in the landscape and how most of us don't really put much thought into what will happen in the future. I'm trying to be more aware of finding a balance between establishing and building things that benefit us and this current project, and recognizing the fact that someone will likely have to clean up my mess in the future, or to have to work around what I may be leaving behind. The work in the gardens has been largely unaffected by the very unusual events of 2021, including the global health crisis. 
And thankfully, we haven't experienced extreme weather or social upheaval locally. But I have become more observant of how the biases that many people seem to have can significantly influence their understanding of what is really going on and can shape their opinions and actions. Although very different contexts, I see this both in how people respond to these global events and how people approach growing food and their opinions relating to different methods we might use in the gardens. Of course, I am no different and my biases definitely get in the way, but I'm glad to have a project like this where I need to work to set aside some of these biases and really try to understand what is happening with the different methods we are exploring. And I feel that this practice in the gardens is helping me to better identify and understand the biases that are influencing how I and others are framing the events and trends in this crazy world. Throughout all of 2021, I had a lot of help in the gardens from Chris, a friend and neighbor who is working with me on this Red Gardens project in order to gain experience in growing food. And all of the work that she does in the gardens has been a huge help, uh, which thankfully will continue for 2022. Having someone else do work on this project like this does require a fair amount of training, as well as explaining what needs to be done and why there are differences in the methods used, which all takes time. But this process really helps me get better at being able to articulate different issues and ideas. And in some cases, this discourse allows me to gain a much better or deeper understanding into what is actually going on all of which helps. I have been uploading videos to this YouTube channel for over five years now, and the positive feedback has been wonderful. The number of views this collection of videos gets rises and falls with the seasons and with the occasional really popular video, but as it has progressively increased each year until this past year. I've not really figured out why the engagement in this channel has plateaued over the last year or so, but continuing to make more videos and trying to upload on a much consistent frequency will probably help, which is what I'm planning to do. But I wanted to thank all of you from around the world who have subscribed to this channel and have continued to watch and engage with my videos. And a special thanks to those people who financially support my work through Patreon and PayPal, as this continuing support has been essential in allowing me to continue for the year. If you would like to join them, please follow the links on the screen or in the description below. But most importantly, thank you for watching.